Good morning and welcome to Southern Maine Healthcare's Medically Speaking. I'm your host, Robert Erickson, and for the next 30 minutes, you'll hear about medical issues and topics of the day directly from leading medical professionals at Southern Maine Healthcare. And my guest this morning is Dr. Loretta Pratt. She specializes in dermatology at Southern Maine Healthcare. Dr. Pratt, welcome to the show. Thank you, Robert. It's nice to be here. And to start off, we often like to talk about uh, you and how you decided to get involved in medicine as a career, and specifically about uh, how you got involved with dermatology. Maybe you could give us a little bit of information about your background. Well, um, growing up, I had a fascination with biology and physiology and how we're made, what makes us work in health and disease. So I was a biology major in college and um, was just fascinated with science and decided to go to medical school. And I guess that's how it started. My dad influenced me a little bit. He would always give me medical journal articles to read. He was not a physician, but he was interested in medicine. He was actually in the Navy. He was a pharmacist mate in the Navy, so he had an interest in medicine. So I think he geared me in that direction without actually telling me. (laughs) So I think that's how I started in medicine. So how does an MD become a dermatologist? What sort of extra education do you need to have? So after graduating medical school, uh, dermatologists have to do at least one year of either internal medicine or pediatrics or some other rotation. And then the dermatology training is a three-year residency. I actually studied internal medicine first for three years, and I did research for a couple of years before actually uh, doing my dermatology training. So you've been in this practice for many years, but you only recently moved to Maine. How how did you make that decision to, uh, to relocate to Maine? Well, my family is actually from Maine. My parents were both born in the Bath area, and I spent summers in Orr's Island, and I just love the state of Maine. I love southern Maine, mid-coast Maine, the coastal areas. It's just been a passion of mine. So when I had the opportunity um, came along, I decided to check it out, and um, it's been great. And any particular reason you chose southern Maine healthcare? Well, I had other options, of course, but uh, when I came here to visit, everyone was just so friendly and welcoming, and the decision was easy. Now, it seems like one of the big challenges for hospitals and medical centers is to find dermatologists. Why is it so difficult to find dermatologists? Well, there are very few dermatologists being trained, and the field is very competitive. So generally, you need to be at the top of your class to obtain a residency position in dermatology. So the spaces are limited for training, and I think many dermatologists because they're in high demand, can choose where they want to live. So many people decide to either stay in their hometowns or prefer, you know, big cities, which was not my choice. (laughs) So when you practice as a dermatologist, I'm sure there's a lot of conditions that you see all the time, and then there are probably a lot of unusual conditions. So what do you expect to see when you go into your office every day? What, what, do you, what kind of conditions do you expect to see? So the most common conditions that we see, of course, include acne, psoriasis, eczema, and skin cancer. Not in that particular order, but those are probably the top four. Uh, we also have some unusual rashes. Sometimes we can figure them out, and sometimes we can't. Sometimes, you know, some things we just can't determine the etiology. Lots of uh, allergies um, can be frustrating. I had a patient one time who came in with chronic hives. The technical term is urticaria. And she'd been to doctor after doctor with just daily itching and incredible, you know, lifestyle changes because she just couldn't control the, the outbreaks. And so each time she came in, I would question her, like, what are you eating? Dietary history. What are you in contact with? And always the same answers. And finally, I said, is there something that you eat every day? And she said, well, I eat one Brazil nut every day. And I was like, how long have you been doing that? And she said, oh, that's when the rash started. 
I said, well, why were you doing that? She said, a friend of mine told me it was healthy. I said, please stop the Brazil nut, and the ration went away. So let's get into a couple of these areas uh, of common things that you might see. Let's talk about acne, for, for instance. How has that particular area of care changed over the last, say, 10, 20 years? Well, for acne, there are, it's multifactorial, so we approach it approach it from different um, aspects because we need to control the propionum bacterium acnes, which is a bacteria found in acne, so antibiotics are used both orally and topically. But it's also a, a, a problem with how the skin exfoliates. So 10 or 20 years ago, doctors would prescribe high-dose vitamin A for acne, and then it was discovered that other retinoids which are vitamin A-like compounds like Accutane also help. So with the advent of Accutane, certainly the field of acne, is, particularly severe acne, has been revolutionized, and people suffering with that can really get great results. So how do you feel when you see some of these commercials on, on television about acne? I mean, at what, point, at what point does somebody need to come and see you? Well, certainly it's worth trying the over-the-counter products. Many of the over-the-counter products do work. The cleansers, including benzoyl peroxide and salicylic acid, are wonderful in uh, cleansing the skin. Uh, some of the problems with uh, teenage with acne is that they tend to over-cleanse the skin, and I'm not a big fan of exfoliating brushes or over overworking the skin because that can be harmful. But certainly over-the-counter cleansers and topical products like Differin has now become over-the-counter. There's an over-the-counter strength. It's a dapoline gel. And the over-the-counter strength is 0.1%, and the prescription strength is 0.3%. So it's definitely worth trying that. So so when, when should they come see you? Well, if the over-the-counter products are not working to their satisfaction, then they should see a dermatologist for sure. So what about some of the other skin conditions that you might regularly treat? Well, dermatologists need to be detectives. And I um, actually co-authored a book called The Life of the Skin back in 1997, which was published by Bantam Books. And it sort of describes many cases of unusual skin diseases in which we really do have to be detectives in, in solving the mystery of the skin. So other common skin problems include psoriasis. And to your question about new therapies, the biological agents have really been life-changing for many patients with psoriasis. So treatments like Humira, Stellara, really work wonders in those patients with extensive psoriasis. Now, do you find when you have patients who come in and they have serious problems with psoriasis, you also have to deal with the psychology of that because the skin obviously is the first thing that people see how how do you deal with the the psychological ramifications of that well first of all understanding that it is an aspect of their disease that emotionally and socially um, they're affected they hide from social activities they have to stay covered up so many of the patients do express that, but sometimes you do have to also ask those questions. How is it affecting your life? So here's a more general question. What, what brings you to work each day? What, what fascinates you about the, the work that you do in dermatology? Well, well, I think what fascinates me most is that the skin is really a window into internal health. And so many times we can detect problems that are happening internally, autoimmune disease, endocrine disease, thyroid disease, even psychological disease that shows up in the skin. So what would you recommend for people in understanding skin? In general, what, what kind of things can you tell our listeners about good skin care? What's the most important thing for people to understand? Well, I think skin care varies with the season, especially in this part of the country. So I've been seeing a lot of winter eczema and winter itch. And many times people feel like they, they call it a rash, but actually what they're doing is over drying their skin with hot baths, hot showers, indoor heat, drying soaps, scented products. You know, some people are very sensitive to their detergents and dryer sheets. So I'm not a big fan of dryer sheets because those chemicals get into your clothing and can exacerbate itching and dryness. 
So certainly hydration of the skin in the winter, avoiding hot showers, hot baths. Many people believe that by soaking their skin, they're hydrating their skin, but they're actually doing the opposite. When you soak in a hot tub, you're actually taking the oils out of your skin and making your skin drier. So moisturizing in the winter time is key. And of course, in the summer, sun protection is of utmost importance to prevent skin cancer. And we're going to get to that that subject a little more in, in just a minute, but uh, I want to talk about covering the skin, especially now when they say the sun is a little stronger than it used to be. What do you tell people about covering up in the wintertime? The sun obviously can be strong, but you're not putting on sunscreen necessarily in the winter. Do you, do you, do you counsel people to do that? What's, what's your recommendation for the winter? Well... Every photon of light that hits your skin is damaging your DNA and your cells. So yes, as a general rule of thumb, having sunscreen on your face, even in the winter time, especially if you're skiing, is really important because of the reflection off of the snow. So yes, protecting your skin all year round is important because the sun's rays are there all the time. (laughs) And what causes skin cancer is the DNA damage from those photons of light that hit the skin. So let's talk about that a little more. The I'm sure the baby boomer generation has a different kind of skin because we, we know more now. A lot of us baby boomers, you just went out and you burned to a crisp at the beach and that's how you started your summer. So what are you seeing intergenerationally about different skin problems? I'm assuming you see different types of skin problems nowadays than you would uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago. Well, I think there's certainly a tremendous amount of skin cancer in the over 50 age group, I'd say. And younger people are still tanning, unfortunately. So the teenagers that want to go to the tanning booth before their prom or before they go for spring break is, is very unacceptable because they don't realize that tanning is a carcinogen. So the tanning booths, the rays in a tanning booth are considered by the FDA to be carcinogenic. So talk a little bit more about that that subject. Uh, we've obviously heard the tanning booths are not necessarily good. Right. Well, the tanning booths have ultraviolet rays just like the sun does. And when you get a tan, it's a sign of sun damage because the skin can only tan after it's been damaged. So when the skin cells detect that they're being damaged, they produce melanin as a protection. So people that have more melanin in their skin are more protected. So essentially when you have a tan, you are more protected, but the process of getting a tan is causing the damage and is a precursor to skin cancer developing. So you you still see a lot of tanning booths in retail situations. Um, Have dermatologists done anything to maybe uh, fight back against against the tanning booth uh, situation? Yes, there's been a a big move among dermatologists to at least prevent tanning in younger people. And dermatologists went to Congress to try to establish a law whereby anyone under the age of 18 would need parental consent before being permitted to go into a tanning booth. And that has gone into effect in many states. So let's talk a little bit about SPF. Uh, the kind of uh, number that you see on sunscreen. So what do you recommend to patients if someone's going to Florida on vacation? What what do you tell them in terms of the kind of SPF that they should be looking for? Well, the American Academy of Dermatology recommends SPF of 30 or higher and applying a sufficient amount to the entire body. So it's estimated that the uh, if you could imagine the amount that would fill a shot glass is what's needed to cover the skin on an average adult. So most people do not apply enough sunscreen, and they don't apply it in all the areas that they need to apply it, including tops of your feet, top of the ears. Many people forget certain areas. And how often do you have to reapply it? If you're at the beach and you go swimming and then you are in the sun again and you're there several hours, what's the guidelines for for reapplying the sunscreen? Yes, reapplication is very important. And if you have a water-resistant sunscreen and you're going in the water, then probably applying less often, but certainly about every two hours is what's recommended. Plus the SPF sort of dictates that. So SPF is sun protection factor. So a sun protection factor of 30 
just means that you can stay in the sun 30 times longer than you normally would be able to without the sunscreen. So for me, if I go in the sun for 10 minutes, I would be burned. So an SPF of 30 would protect me for 300 minutes, unless I'm in the water and it's not water resistant. Before we get onto the subject of skin cancer, are there any new treatments for general skin conditions that you're excited about or you, you've heard about that you may not be offering now, but maybe will be available in the, in the not too distant future? Yes. Um, a condition that's very difficult to treat in many patients is alopecia or hair loss. And there's a condition called alopecia areata, alopecia universalis, where pe people lose large areas of hair on the scalp. And the new field of JAK inhibitors, that's J-A-K inhibitors, is really probably going to improve treatment options in those patients. So you think those might be offered sometime in the, in the near future? Yes, the JAK inhibitors will be available in the next six months, most likely as the research is being finalized. We're talking with Dr. Loretta Pratt. She's a dermatologist at Southern Maine Healthcare, and we'll be right back with more of our discussion coming up right after this. For high-quality walk-in care, the best team is always on the ball. Look for Southern Maine Healthcare's Orange Walk-In Care Ball. With convenient locations open every day, it's your guarantee of quality walk-in care delivered by your hometown team. And we're back with our guest, Dr. Loretta Pratt. I'd like to ask you about a topic that you are seem particularly passionate about, skin cancer and the treatment of skin cancer. You haven't been at Southern Maine Healthcare very long, but have you seen many cases in Southern Maine, and, uh, and how often would you diagnose that? Just in the last few months, we've diagnosed probably at least half a dozen melanoma skin cancers and many other basal cell and squamous cell skin cancers. So it is very prevalent across the United States. Now, you've been practicing for quite a while. Are you seeing an increase from your perspective in the diagnosis of skin cancers? Well, the statistics are that one in five people will develop skin cancer in their lifetime. So yes, the numbers are definitely up there. And I can't stress enough the importance of annual skin cancer screenings for all adults. So what do you look for when you have a patient come in? Do you uh, look for certain age categories? Is, is it just older folks that you're seeing, or is it young people as well? Any adult over the age of 18 should get annual skin cancer screenings, and especially if they've had any amount of sun exposure, use of tanning beds, or have an occupation or hobby that requires them to be in the sun. Certainly lifeguards, farmers, golfers have a high incidence of skin cancer. So what's the best way for people to manage that? Obviously, people like to do recreation outside. Their people are outside all the time for the most part. How, how can they avoid getting skin cancer? Well, the best recommendations are to seek shade when you can, avoid peak hours of sun, especially on the beach, uh, between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Those are the peak hours of sun exposure. Wear SPF of at least 30 or higher and reapply. Wear a hat, some protective clothing, and sunglasses. So what kind of skin cancers have you seen? Maybe you could tell us about, uh, about the different types that you see. The three main types of skin cancer are basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and malignant melanoma. Of course, malignant melanoma is the most deadly form of skin cancer. And the important thing to know about that is it's entirely curable and treatable in its early stages. So when you diagnose someone with that, what are, what are the first things that you do? So basal cell skin cancers usually appear on the face. They can look like a little translucent bump. Sometimes they are non-healing. So the first thing to do would to be a, a biopsy so that we could send that specimen to the pathologist to confirm the diagnosis. And depending on the location of the basal cell, uh, it can be treated with surgery, or sometimes we do what we call electrodesiccation with a curatage to remove the skin cancer. But it also depends on the type of basal cell because there actually are different kinds, including superficial and nodular and even pigmented basal cells. So depending on the type and location really dictates the treatment options. The squamous cell carcinomas usually look like scaly bumps that are red and start to grow. And those are uh, more dangerous than the basal cells, which generally do not metastasize into the body. But squamous cell skin cancers, especially on the head and neck, can spread into the body and metastasize. 
So again, early treatment, early diagnosis is the key here. Now there's a type of surgery called Mohs micrographic surgery. It's M-O-H-S. And it actually was invented by a man named Fred Mohs. That was his name, but they turned his name into an acronym for microscopically or oriented histologic surgery. So that's a layer by layer technique where skin cancers are removed and it does provide the highest cure rate for skin cancer treatment. Of course, melanoma skin cancers, as I said previously, are entirely curable in their early stages and the treatment would be surgery. If melanomas are more advanced, then other treatments including immunotherapy and chemotherapy would be needed. But in the early stages, they're treated surgically. Now, do you do Mo surgery? Nope. There are specialized doctors. Uh, they have special training in Mo surgery. And where should people be looking for these, uh, these signs of, uh, of skin cancer? Well, skin cancer can occur anywhere on the body. And some melanomas are actually genetically predetermined but triggered by sun exposure. So anyone with a family history of melanoma should be consider themselves at high risk and have their skin examined even twice a year, if not once. So if someone can't see a dermatologist regularly, and obviously everyone gets moles from time to time, what, what are the things that people should be looking for when they see something uh, unusual on their own body? Well, the, the general rule of thumb is uh, people should not get new true moles after the age of 30 or 35. So anything, anything that looks like a new mole after that age it would be suspicious. Anything that is new, any lesion that grows in size or changes in shape or color is suspicious. Any non-healing spot, anything that even could look like a pimple that doesn't go away could be suspicious. I have found what we call amelanotic melanomas, which are melanomas that are pink and don't have color. So melanoma can be any color. Melanoma can be white, blue, black, pink, and red. So anything that does not look like it's been there for a long time, anything new changing is considered suspicious. And certainly if um, the audience can't get in to see a dermatologist, they should at least see their family doctor for an evaluation and hopefully get a referral if needed to see a dermatologist. Dr. Pratt, what is your personal approach to patient care? Well, as a dermatologist with my internal medicine background, I like to evaluate the whole patient. So when I see a patient, I do take a full medical history, history of what medications they're taking, allergies. I ask them about their lifestyle because so many times lifestyle interacts with the skin, psychological problems interact with how they present with skin disease. And I also take a nutritional history because oftentimes that's really key in both diagnosing what's going on in their skin or in actually, when modifying their diet, can improve their skin condition. Can you give us an example about a particularly interesting case? Maybe you, you've said it's like being a detective where you've had to uh, assemble the clues that are available to you to, uh, to solve a problem that someone is having? Yes, one patient that comes to mind uh, was a gentleman. He was a, a bodybuilder, and he, he liked to show off his muscles, I guess, and he had a fungal rash. Of course, you know, working in the gym, sweating, working on the mats, he was exposed, and he got a skin fungus. And we would clear it up, and it would just keep coming back. So I knew that this particular fungus likes the oils in certain people's skin. So one day he came in, and I just happened to ask him, are you putting olive oil on your skin? Because I know a lot of bodybuilders do put oil on their skin to, to shine them shine their skin up, especially for competition and that sort of thing. It was like, well, yeah, how'd you know? And I said, well, that's the reason why we can't get rid of the fungus, because you're feeding the fungus on your skin with the olive oil. And he stopped it, and we were able to eradicate his uh, his extensive fungal rash. Now, as a dermatologist, I'm sure you see there are so many things that you might be seeing with people's skin. Do you get ongoing training to keep up with all this? Yes. So all physicians, including dermatologists, are required to do what we call continuing medical education. And certainly we stay updated on new developments in skin diseases, the latest therapies through those continuing education courses. A lot of dermatologists are members of the American Academy of Dermatology, and they have an annual meeting, a summer meeting, where we are updated on everything new 
in the field. So how much has it changed overall since you started doing this so many years ago? It's really changed dramatically, and particularly in the areas of immunotherapy and the biological agents. So, so many of the treatments for psoriasis, hydranitis aperitiva, eczema are biological agents. Uh, many of them are used monoclonal antibodies. And so the, the field is really booming right now, and I think the advances will continue to occur and improve patient lives. So if someone wants to talk to you and, and get in touch with you, what's the easiest way for them to do that? Well, we are at Southern Maine Healthcare Dermatology in Kennebunk, and the phone number is 467-8800. Now, would someone need a referral to see you? Depending on a patient's insurance, they may need a referral from their primary care physician to see the dermatologist. But every insurance is different. They would have to check with their insurance company or their primary care physician to know that. Well, Dr. Loretta Pratt, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Join me next week at this time for a new guest and an enlightening discussion about health care in our communities. Brought to you exclusively by Southern Maine Healthcare, your trusted resource for health care in Southern Maine.